Hello, hello, hello. How is everyone doing? Ah, still processing. And also, I just learned that Quiet On Set has now released in the UK. So I want to give a shout out and a hello to everyone in the UK. It's so wild because I didn't even know that there was going to be like multiple different, you know, releases. And so I'm getting all these messages from people who are just watching it now for the first time. And, you know, I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, for watching the documentary. You know, this has been a long time coming. Honestly, too long. It's uh, for me personally, 20 years. And for others, it is has been a lot longer than that. And, you know, we have been living pretty much alone within these memories for so long that to have this type of support means the world. And so thank you all so much for just supporting every single voice that has sat down and, you know, been a part of Quiet On Set and now there's an episode five coming out. Apparently someone new is coming forward that worked on all that. And this is what it's all about, right? It's all about paving the way for people to feel safe enough to come forward. Because sadly, Nickelodeon and many different institutions in general do not create safe spaces for people to come forward. If anything, they end up covering it up. And, you know, this is why this work is so important is because, you know, we got P. Diddy now, obviously, but I do want to remind everyone that in Cassie's lawsuit, right, she mentions how these entities, these institutions were complicit, allegedly. And she mentions how someone at Sony Music was telling her that she had to stay with P. Diddy or else they weren't going to release her album. And so as we focus in on Nickelodeon, which is extremely important, I hope that the work continues and the attention stays put on all of these institutions within the entertainment industry that have been covering up this type of behavior for far too long. And so there is a lot of work still to be done because it is still happening today, sadly. It isn't just 20 years ago. You know, it, it has been for a long time and it's currently still happening. Welcome new members. Thank you so much for being here. What we got, Justin, always followed your work for a while. Keep it up. Thank you so much, Justin W. and Zach. Hello from the UK. Oh, there we go. We got some UK sending you so much love. Thank you so much, Zach. This has been so wild. And I do just want to remind everyone, you know, please like this video because it really, really helps get, you know, this type of advocacy work in the algorithm because YouTube doesn't necessarily always boost this type of content. So please hit the like button, please, or press the like button. I kind of hate the word hit. Um, please press the like button. Your support really does matter. And welcome new members, Brendan, Crystal. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, so we have a lot to get into today. My husband really put together a serious deep dive when it comes to enablers of Brian Peck. And... Just for a little refresh, uh, E-Predators really started because I started to realize at a very young age, honestly, obviously with Nickelodeon, but even after that, when it came to the music industry, I'm sure, sadly, maybe many of you know, whoa, <laughs> like, is P. Diddy around? I hear a helicopter. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's like, uh, that's like military plane helicopter as i'm speaking about all of this <laughs> it's like wait what's going on um where was i okay so institutions for me personally i started to learn about how institutions were covering up at a very young age when it came to nickelodeon but when i got a lot older and i started processing you know everything that happened to me 
from 16 to what was it like 26 and I mean honestly a little bit after that as well when I started to process that I sadly had to learn how for example Live Nation which owns red light management which if you haven't seen that video of mine you know if you can stomach it it is a lot but I sadly realized how a corporation like Live Nation was complicit in covering up my CSA. And when I realized that and I started to uncover all of the layers, hi, Becca, welcome. I haven't seen you in a minute. Hi, Becca. Becca's been here since honestly the beginning. I saw um, so said, nice to said, see you. She said, tap that like. Tap that like. I love it. Tap that like. So for me personally, you know, it's been a constant um, uncovering of all of these institutions. And when I realized that Live Nation, again, owns red light management, covered up CSA, you know, this was a, I mean, it was beyond devastating. I could barely walk up the stairs when I found out what they did to me. I was so devastated Obviously, to be honest with you, I'm still pretty devastated, but I could barely walk up the stairs. And I think a lot of the time as a survivor, we are very zeroed in when it comes to the P-R-E-D, you know, the predators, right? We're very zeroed in. And that's what, honestly, the first step when it comes to processing what happened to you, that's where the focus goes. And though... Sadly, when it comes to the entertainment industry, or we've also learned when it comes to the Catholic Church and many different uh, institutions in general, that there is a bigger picture. There is someone creating a safe haven for this individual. And sometimes not only just creating a safe haven, but also complicit when it comes to allowing them to gain more access to human life with the intentions of, you know, not being so good, right? And so when I first processed that or realized that really, I guess I'm still processing that, I didn't know what to do. I felt so alone and I felt so terrified and I felt so, I felt like I was in another universe, to be honest with you. Because like, how was I going to explain what I just found out? And are people going to believe me? Because it's already hard enough to get people to believe you as a survivor, to, to get people to believe what happened to you. That's already extremely difficult. Then you add on the layer of major institutions covering up for that person. And not many people will get on board when it comes to that, to be quite honest with you. So I felt very much alone. And... Honestly, it was almost like a trauma response when I just said, I'm going to start protesting. I'm going to start physically showing up in front of these institutions and in front of these alleged, you know, predators. And not even if it's impacted me personally, this was for other survivors. This was for people, you know, other people's predators. And I thought, wow, what I really want to see in the world is survivors uniting. And what that means to me has changed, to be honest with you, over the last few years. And now for me, this isn't about, this isn't about necessarily liking, right, every survivor. I, I don't think survivors need to be likable for you to believe them, for you to want them to get justice. And so for me over the years, it's changed. And now I'm at the place where if someone is a survivor, we, and you're a survivor, <laughs> we need to support that individual in seeking justice because we are way more powerful together, way more powerful together. And if we get together, and actually start making our voices known, not only for ourselves, but for fellow survivors, I really do believe that we can change the world. But then there's another step to that, right? And the other step to that is allies. 
because unfortunately we can't just do it alone as survivors. We need allies, family members, friends, people out there that care about this cause as much as we do. And so, you know, this is how it kind of all came to be. This is how I got here where I am today was realizing this needed to be taken very seriously. And most importantly, we have to put a lot of pressure on the enablers because without them, these uh, predators do not have safe havens. They don't have, you know, easy access to potential victims. And then they also don't have anyone covering up for them. Because I know that there's a lot of debate and discussion when it comes to cancel culture. And I really don't even believe cancel culture exists, to be quite honest with you. I haven't really seen it play out in real time. But this isn't about cancel culture. This is about not financially rewarding anyone that ABUSES, anyone, human life, human beings. Because we send a message every time we financially reward someone that harms other people. It's not going to get them to stop. If anything, they think they're going to keep getting away with it and they gain more power, more momentum, and more resources. So as a community as well, we are all involved in this. We can maybe, you know, pretend that we're not involved and, you know, put our hands over our ears, but like it or not, community matters. And how we show up in this world does have a domino effect. And manipulative people like predators know this. They actually prey on people looking the other way, and they also prey on people uh, not taking it seriously, right? That's what they honestly prey on because it allows them to continue. And so, For me personally, this is what all of this is. You know, this is, most of this behind me, enablers. Enablers that I have been protesting for over two years now. Because I know the weakness for a predator, and that is their enablers. And so we really need to make sure that, yes, we stay focused on people like Brian Peck, or we stay focused on people like Dan Schneider. Absolutely, there needs to be accountability there. And also, we really have to look at who is giving them access to more victims and enabling them. And, you know, obviously, when it comes to Dan Schneider and honestly, Brian Peck, we got Nickelodeon. And we really have to stay firm. And, and disciplined when it comes to holding these institutions accountable. Because for so long, they pretend, they like to say, that firing or letting go, right, the person who is harming others is a liability issue. Well, I'm here to play devil's advocate with them because I think it's way more of a liability to create a safe haven for this individual who gives them more access to more victims. Because guess what that means? More lawsuits, potentially, in the future. And so I believe it's actually a greater liability to not take a survivor's story seriously when they come forward and, and tell an institution what this individual has been doing. We must take it seriously. And also for the institution... It's a better um, business strategy. And sadly, these uh, companies, these institutions, all they really care about is money. They don't care about human life. Don't get it twisted. They, do, they will never do anything as an entity, as a corporation, out of the goodness of their hearts. They do it all to um, save their assets, as Quiet says. <laughs> That's what they're in it for. And so we have to... Find a way to show them, find a way to show them that it is a greater liability for them and there is a greater loss for them if they enable these individuals. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Because sadly, these uh, Dan Schneiders, these Brian Pecks, these people, Jason Handy, 
It's a revolving door. There are so many predators out there, sadly. And when one gets removed, another one enters. And so how do we, how do we stop that from happening? And it really is putting pressure on the institutions that protect them and that cover up for them. And so this is why I started this work. This work, you know, obviously a lot of people will say I'm going after predators. I'm also going after the institutions. That's, I see, I see I'm about to go over there right now. Look at, oh, everyone, you're so sweet. Welcome new members, welcome new members. Oh, and that's another thing, so tomorrow, we're back to members only on Fridays, and we're going to be watching Open Secret together, uh, which, by the way, is obviously a triggering subject. And so please, you know, if you're going to be um, a part of that, make sure you're taking care of yourself. Trigger warning, trigger warning. But we're going to be watching Open Secret together, and also we're going to be doing a little bit of a, uh, a deep dive of sorts, looking into who was behind Open Secret, because I have said before that I've heard sadly that Open Secret producers, for example, were not necessarily kind whatsoever to the people they were reaching out to, to you know, to be on the record for the documentary and blaming a survivor. And so we're gonna kind of see who was behind that, what was really going on there while we watched this documentary. So that's for every member dinner party and up. So I'm so excited to see everyone tomorrow. Oh my God, look. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 Roy. I can't even say that yet. Um, um, like button, guys. Alexi, you were amazing and so strong. Love you so much. Thank you so much, Roy. Thank you so much, Sophia. Longtime listener of the podcast. First time catching a live. Wow, Sophia, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for all you've done for survivors and continue to do. I look up to you so much. Blessings from Australia. Thank you so much, Sophia. Lily, I just found your channel yesterday and I love everything you stand for from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for continuing to fight the good fight. Thank you so much, Lily. And Justine, huge fan. Alexa, you're my biggest inspo. I identify with you and your opinion so much and I feel like I know you. Love from NJ. Thank you so much, Justine. And Zach, it's so sad how long it's been going on. Yes, it is so sad. And that's because these institutions love love to go oh it's another rotten apple like it's another bad apple and what i like to say is the roots of the tree are rotten that's why the apples are rotten too and that's just a truth because they want us to focus in on just the individuals not the institutions because there's a lot more to lose there and just before we go into this, I do want to say this, that predatory behavior shows up in many different ways, not just essay, okay? Predatory behavior is when someone preys on the weaknesses of others and exploits that. And sometimes it's something that we see as a strength. They'll see it as a weakness and they will exploit that. And you can call it capitalism, you can call it many different things, right? And so predatory behavior shows up in many different ways. And what I found out is that the reason why the bottom, right, of this pyramid essentially is, is so predatory is because the top is too. And just because their predatory behavior doesn't show up in the same exact ways as someone who commits essay, for example, it's still predatory. And I do believe these individuals worship predatory behavior. That's what they're in it for. And so it's top bottom, bottom top. And so for us to really make a difference, we got to go to the top because that's the trickle down effect. And that's the protection of these individuals. And it's way bigger than just essay. We're talking about straight up every type of predatory business, predatory government, all of it. It's predatory behavior. And that's what I stand against. And so that's why I sit here uh, regularly trying to get as many people on board to, to go up against predatory behavior. Because, ew, right? Anyone who wants to prey on the weaknesses of others is gross. Blech. Yeah. It's gross. 
And it's way bigger than just SA or the Me Too movement, right? And so maybe one day I'll do an episode about that. Well, I can break down exactly how, what I've learned about predatory behavior and how much it shows up in our society and how much almost also unknowingly we are, we are recycling even predatory behavior. I even like to say that when we have a negative thought about ourselves, that's predatory behavior on ourselves. It's because we've learned that type of behavior, that type of predatory behavior, where we look at the weaknesses in ourselves and we even exploit that. That's learned predatory behavior. And so it's way bigger than just this, but today obviously we're talking about a CSA and we're gonna go into the enablers of Brian Peck, in my opinion. I mean, obviously just straight up, there's people that were hiring Brian Peck you know, after his conviction. And so it's really important to know these people because they don't really necessarily like being known once they get found out, as we've learned from people like Rich Carell. And where's James Marsden, or whatever his name is? Has he even said a statement? That's because apparently I think Brian Peck was his um, best man at his wedding, by the way. And I've heard through the grapevine that he's also the godfather of his children. You know, could be true, could not be, but I've heard it from some credible sources. And so where is James Marsden? Again, those 41 letters that were written in protection of Brian Peck is what I'm talking about. These predators thrive when they are protected. There he is. There's James Marsden. I had to pull him up because I didn't know exactly what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet. That's a You're like, who is Alexa yeah. talking about? I, heard, I mean, I, I heard the name, but I, yeah, I didn't know. He's pretty well he known. I didn't know this is who he is. He's pretty well known. And he wrote a letter in defense of Brian Peck. I mean, come on. Like, that just says a lot. And he knew enough, right? Don't let these enablers, because of shame, right? It's okay for you maybe to have some empathy for them, to be honest with you. It's normal. It's human to feel like, okay, you know, I want to go after the predator or the institution really covering up for them. 100%. But let's not let enablers lie to us because they lie out of shame. The reason why they're lying is coming from a shameful place, but still we cannot allow that type of lie. They definitely knew enough to not write those letters or to not enable that type of behavior. So let's not, let's not forget about that. Tommy, the rotten roots support the rotten apples is such a powerful statement. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. It was so simple, but I never even thought of it that way. Thanks, Tommy Bones. Thank you so much. Devani, hi, Alexa. How did you get your uh, NDA removed? Heart you. I never actually signed an NDA. No one's ever gotten me to be silent. <laughs> That's probably why they all hate me so much. No one's, no one's made me sign NDA, but... I have <laughs> no one's gotten me to sign NDA, but to be honest, when it came to the Live Nation covering up my CSA, for example, and adult essay, they they did it a different way in a stipulated judgment. And, you know, that's another episode that maybe there is an episode that I did about this when it comes to Live Nation doing that to me. And that's where I learned how these freaking institutions, how they function and what they do and how dangerous they truly are. They have the resources to protect these people. And that's what's super scary. Ashley, your discussion about stalkers made my 17-year-old self feel so seen. My 35-year-old self healed a little more that day. Thank you so much, Alexa. Ashley, that is an honor. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to all new members. So where was I? Okay, yeah, okay, so we're gonna get into it. We're gonna look at who enabled, but before we do that, now that there's like a, a lot of people in here, can you just please um, like this video? It will really help boost. Tap the like, tap the like. Tap the like, as Becca says, tap the light, like, <laughs> tap the like, because um, it really helps boost survivor-led and survivor-centric uh, content creators like myself and, um, activists to be quite honest with you so thank you so much and also subscribe and put your notifications on all of that really really helps also we don't have any corporate sponsors uh for uh this show because they don't really like me that much so this is all community built and so i do want to give a shout out today to our patreon members thank you so much i've been seeing the community grow on patreon and just to remind everyone our Patreon is specifically really for the movement and all these side projects that I'm creating, like a 
survivor led survivor centric uh, publishing where we are going to start creating a digital and also physical magazine essentially that helps educate people about these issues and also highlights and celebrates survivors and I'm in the midst of that right now and so thank you so much Patreon members also April 6th we're protesting the LAPD. <laughs> so we're protesting the LAPD. You know, they've been covering up as well. This is part of the rotten roots issue. And they are definitely rotten roots. And they've been covering up survivor stories for far too long and actually enabling powerful individuals. You know, in my opinion, like someone like P. Diddy, right? Or, you know, record labels, networks, et cetera. Scientology. Scientology, it's LAPD for sure with Scientology. And so we're gonna be protesting April 6th. And so that helps with all of these protest signs, the graphic design work that we, me and my husband put into all of these signs. And so I just wanna give a huge shout out to all the Patreon members. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And there's also a little bit of perks in there too that are different than the YouTube membership. So you can go check it out there. And then also we have the, um, t-shirts and the and the sweatshirts power to survivors this really also helps make it sustainable for me to keep sitting down here every day uh so thank you to everyone who has gotten a sweatshirt or a tote it really does matter and the reason why i created these sweaters and these t-shirts was because i really really wanted survivors to start seeing people showing and advocating for them and and sending out positive affirmations because for the most part survivors get negative um, affirmations thrown at them and i want survivors to be at a grocery store or at a concert or at a coffee shop and just see someone wear power to survivors means so much to me and recently i was wearing that sweater and i was at trader joe's <laughs> And all these random people were like, power to survivors. And I was like, I forgot I was wearing the sweater. And I was so moved. I was like, I was so confused. I thought maybe they watched the channel. And then I realized I was wearing the sweater. And it was just a nice moment where as a survivor, I felt supported by the community. And so I hope that happens to you too, if you ever wear the sweater. And please send me a story, you know, if that does happen. But it was pretty magical and it was hilarious that I totally forgot that I was wearing the sweater. I was like, you watch the YouTube? And then I was like, no, I'm wearing the sweater. But it was super nice. And so thank you to everyone who's been supporting the channel. This is 100% community built and I appreciate every single one of you. Okay, all right, here we go. So let's dive into who has enabled Brian Peck. And this goes pretty deep, you guys. Not only Nickelodeon, but obviously James Marsden and so many different people that are higher up within the entertainment industry. And so we're going to really go through it. We're going to look at these names. We're going to look at who these people are. We're going to look at how and what they hire Brian Peck for. We're going to watch the footage. We're honestly going to dive into it all. And so buckle up, uh, maybe grab a drink of water, a drink, whatever. And uh, this is going to go pretty, pretty deep. So we can show my screen. Alexa thought, um, had, wait, Dan Schneider had his back. Brian, you know, I think it's very valid for Drake to say that because his personal experience with Dan Schneider was that. But it's the same thing when it comes to James Marsden or all of these other people. Not that I'm saying Drake, Drake actually supports everybody who um, has sat down for the documentary. But what I'm saying is it's like everyone's going to have their own experience with predators, sadly. And that's because predators look at everyone, again, finding the weakness and the advantage in them. And they exploit it. And so if they're not an actual target or a victim, then they're going to prey on them being a loyal bystander. And so they'll show different versions of themselves of themselves to 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 gain an advantage. And so it doesn't mean that someone's experience is wrong. Let's say if someone says, I never saw that type of behavior. This person was super nice to me, yada, 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 yada. I'm sure they were because they need you for something too. And so that's how predators work. And we, we don't want to forget that. So instead of going, oh, I don't really believe the survivor because this other person had an experience with them that doesn't match. No, no, no. 
there's a reason to that. They need that other person to say just that. Oh, it never happened to me. That's what they wanted. Boom, they got it. So every, with a predator, everything is prey. Everything. Not just the victim. And that's what we really need to start educating bystanders about, is that it's not just the victim that is prey to the predator. It is also the bystanders. They know exactly what they need, who they need, and how to do it. And that's how intelligent, honestly, a predator can be. Extremely manipulative. And when people blame the parents, for example, on set when it came to Nickelodeon Listen, that's because Nickelodeon, when it comes to corporate entities, extremely predatory, manipulative, exploitative, all of it. And so everyone is a is a prey to a predator. And so as a community, we must remember that, that if we hear different stories, that's because those are different versions of the predator that they have had to manifest and create for themselves in order to gain access to the very specific victim and continue to gain access to other potential victims. And that's kind of how it... Uh, that's how it goes. <laughs> That's, I kind of, I've figured them out a little bit, let's just say. I've maybe done a little bit too much research and I've maybe done a little bit too much, uh, I don't know, thinking about it all. But that is really what I have personally seen as true. And so that's why we got to get bystanders super educated. I really want to hopefully in the future start implementing, you know, courses when it comes to people that are working at corporations so that the bystanders are super educated and they can start to pick up on predatory behavior. And even if they're not picking up on it, when someone comes to them, they understand that there's multiple sides to a predator. And it's all about figuring out which version to be to gain access to that person for that specific thing that they want from them. And it's spooky. It's really spooky. And that's why I don't like predators. <laughs> I don't like them at all. And we got to get people to stop enabling them. So, okay, let's show my screen. We're going to start digging into this. We're going to get into also that, uh, what's his name? Victor, oh God, the guy that, 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 the PDF file that Disney hired for powder and, uh, what was it? Jeepers Creepers too, but specifically powder at Disney. Okay, here we go. All right, so who enabled Brian Peck? Maybe I can make this a little bit smaller so people can see this a little bit better. Can I? Oh, yeah, I can. Perfect. It's like... Oh, yeah, yeah, true. Well, I'm going to be going back and forth, though, but I kind of hate that it won't let me do, like, multiple screens of it. Kind of bums me out, to be quite honest with you. I want it in multiple screens. Okay. Not today. Not right now. Oh, thank you so much, Alyssa, for gifting a membership to someone that's so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We also... There... I should, pro I should probably put on a, a link to our PayPal. It's an ePredators uh, PayPal. So I should probably include that if it's like a bigger donation. I don't know if Patreon allows bigger donations. I'm not sure if you can actually choose your donation on Patreon or not. Um, but if you do want to, that's super sweet. Please email us at eatpredators at gmail.com. And then I can give you a link to do that. And I really, really appreciate you. Thank you. Who is it that said that? Oh, oh, Alyssa. Alyssa, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Okay. Please email us. All right, here we go. <sighs> deep inhale, deep exhale. So who enabled Brian Peck? Well, let's see. So here's his, the, the first one is LB Hecht. And, you know, by the way, this is obviously, in my opinion, this is from looking at the beginning of Brian Peck at Nickelodeon, obviously, and afterwards. So LB's first job at Nickelodeon was as a creative executive, and he started in 1984. He played a significant role in developing the network's brand and programming during its early years. Double Dare, 
1986, a game show known for its messy physical challenges. And just to say, also to note here, is that I'm pretty positive on one of the blogs, shout out to Obscure Nick, they said that on one of Dan Schneider's deleted blog posts, that LB was the one who brought Dan Schneider to Nickelodeon. Like he was the one who hired him. So maybe let's take a let's take a quick look at uh, a little clip of this double dare. I don't know if anyone in the chat. Let me know if you've if you've watched this. You mean this? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Twenty bucks in control of the show that soaks you with cash by doubling the dough. Okay. Here's your double dare host. So it's basically Sutter. just like a game show with children. Okay, so basically it's a game show with children. They're making them do some type of like athletic, whatever, uh, sports essentially. And, you know, we've seen things like this before. It's double dare. I guess this is what LB really. Um, became known for at Nickelodeon and really helped him enter into the Nickelodeon realm. So let's keep diving into this. So Brian Peck's first job as a production assistant at Nickelodeon was on the iconic children's television show, Double Dare. So that little snippet that we were watching, Brian Peck's first job as a production assistant at Nickelodeon was Double Dare. So from my knowledge, as of now, LB was the person who brought Brian Peck into the Nickelodeon realm. So let's not forget this guy, 1986, and also brought Dan Schneider in as well. Ah, so LB Hecht was promoted to vice president of production and development at Nickelodeon in 1989. LB Hecht strategically hired Brian Robbins and Dan Schneider. Their collaborative efforts under Hecht's leadership resulted in the creation of iconic Nickelodeon shows and movies contributing significantly to the network's success and cultural impact. Oh God, okay, wait. Oh my God, so Brian Peck was casted as Pickle Boy. We all know that, but let's just watch it, actually. Let's just take a, 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 quick, a quick peek at really uh, Brian Peck's uh, beginning here. Why does it always not? Give me that. Give me the actual volume, please. Oh. Aaron Carter. There's so many strange innuendos with Dan Schneider in general, but also with Brian Peck, where he's looking down. Did you see that? And then he looks at a child, and then he looks down, and then it's pickles. Also, he's like he's like holding it in like a way that's like at his crotch. I know, like purposefully. I know. That's that's this is what I don't like about any of that's this. Like, that is the joke of it. Yeah, it is. And it's children again. Like Aaron Carter was a child there. And we're seeing Brian Peck, like, look down, look up at Aaron Carter, and, you know, we all know what it means. Okay, so Brian Peck was cast as Pickle Boy as a series regular who interacted with the cast and celebrities. So here's LB, I guess, with David Spade. I met David Spade once, and I did not have a good experience with him, to be quite honest with you. Fred Durst, kind of a douche, right? So anyways, here, but Pamela Anderson's amazing, by the way. She does. She LB stay away from Pamela Anderson, please stay away from Pamela Anderson. Okay, so Brian Robbins. Brian Robbins is now the president of Nickelodeon. Brian Robbins, upon joining Nickelodeon, Brian Robbins served as a producer for all that and played a key role in the production of the sitcom Keenan and Kel, while also directing the feature film adaptation of Good Burger, solidifying his impact within the Nickelodeon ecosystem through a range of creative roles. Brian Peck was casted as an upset customer in Good Burger. Let's check it out. Give me this volume. It's not going to do it. What is with it with TikTok? 
That's so one good weird. With nothing. On it. Excuse me. Look, I ordered one good burger with nothing on it. That's what I gave you. No, you gave me a bun. Just a bun. Look, there's no meat in here. But you said you wanted nothing on it. Yes, well, I expected a meat patty. Dude, a meat patty is something. You said nothing. Fizz, is a meat patty something or nothing? Uh, something? I win. All right, that rips Interesting. It. I am reporting your name to the manager. Interesting, though, that it was Brian Robbins, because it's, wasn't it Brian Robbins who directed Good Burger, right? I vividly yes. remember this scene. Yeah, me too, actually. So Brian, so Brian Robbins directed Good Burger. Dan Schneider wrote it, and so here, right, right away, we're seeing Brian Peck showing up in a project again with Brian Robbins and Dan Schneider, which is why we're doing all this because I love that Dan Schneider, when he did his, you know, his not real apology video, he said, "Oh, Brian Robbins was the one who hired, you know, uh, Brian Peck." Okay. Kind of, sort of, I guess. But also, we're going to find out that Dan Schneider also hired Brian Peck and um, as one of the creepiest roles of all, to be quite honest can, with can you. Can we just pause for one second? Yeah. A, as a kid watching that... Yeah. Like... Which one? Wait, what? Good Burger? The, yeah, the Good oh. Burger with uh, w with um, Brian Peck in it. Mm -hmm. that, like, that scene. I remember that scene now. Like, I mean, I never thought of it until just now. So now watching it, like, back after all these years, I mean, I didn't... It, it w it was funny back then. I thought that joke was funny, mm -hmm. but I, it was it was what the joke was. But now watching it as an adult, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, that joke isn't what the kid thinks that joke is exactly. supposed to be. Exactly. And now it's inappropriate. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because it was written by an adult, not by a kid. It would be so different. Like when Dan Schneider's like, oh, you know, kids are looking at this and laughing and think it's funny. You're like... Yeah, but you're not a kid. You're an adult writing this, and we all know what the innuendo is when you wrote this, dude. If it's... it was written for adults, I think it it would be okay. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Weird. Well, yeah, weird. that'd be kind of different. But also, he is. But also, when we know what we know about him, it's not really okay. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. when it comes to Brian Peck specifically, it's bad. If it was an adult show and it wasn't Brian Peck, it's like a little bit different, obviously. Oh, wait, so this is, oh, Keenan and Cal. Okay, so here's Brian Peck, Brian Robbins hiring him for Keenan and Cal. I'm Brock Richards, and this is the Illinois Turbo Lotto. All righty, the time has finally come. Yeah. Let's get these balls a bouncing. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Every single thing with Brian Peck, it doesn't matter what you're choosing, right? It doesn't matter what you're choosing. There is some innuendo with Brian Peck. Every single time. And remember, so we got LB now. Now we have Brian Robbins. And we got Dan Schneider. So it seems like they're really close together. LB, Dan Schneider, and uh, Brian Peck. I know someone was saying that Brian Peck and Dan Schneider had like a camp together uh, for children. If someone has um, a paragraph or something from that Los Angeles time, Epstein Island. Yeah, no, that, yeah, they had a camp on Epstein Island. That would be insane. And obviously, maybe not so far of a reach, to be quite honest with you. But if someone has, like, a little bit of a quote from the Los Angeles Times article about that Brian Peck and Dan Schneider camp that they allegedly had, please put it in the chat. What, a camp? Yeah, dude, that's why it's so bad. And I'm surprised, like, not that many people have really honestly come forward when it comes to that camp or what that was. But it's, like, Dan Schneider and Brian Peck having a camp together like what are you guys doing and when you see how they write brian peck into these scripts and what they make him play it gets worse and worse okay so we got brian robbins here good burger and keenan and cal now we have dan schneider dan schneider was writer and co-creator of good burger sketches and led creation of all that he also served as a creator and executive producer of The Amanda Show, created and executive producer of Guys Like Us. Now, you guys, this... 
When when my husband found this, I first of all, when we think about like who enabled Brian Peck, it's guys like these, all right? So these are the guys that, in my opinion, enabled somebody like Brian Peck. Because as we look at the footage, you can tell there's innuendos every single time when Brian Peck shows up on screen. But when my husband found guys like us, I I honestly couldn't believe it. Because obviously, if you would have watched this footage before the documentary, you'd be like, okay, it's kind of creepy, right? You got, you see it and you're like, that's creepy. Now, knowing that Brian Peck had a pen pal ship with John Wayne Gacy, John Wayne Gacy, and that the painting was just beside his bed, a room, and then he had letters and was showing children, you better believe that when Dan Schneider went and hung out with Brian Peck, what the which fuck is this? <laughs> I don't know, honestly. But you better believe that when Dan Schneider ever hung out with someone, with, with Brian Peck, Brian Peck probably showed him his pen pal ship with John Wayne Gacy, or you know, maybe possibly mentioned it in passing. Because when you see this clip, it just makes your skin crawl because not only is he a fucking clown, but he is also a clown by the name of Happy Pants, and he has a scene with children. And when Dan Schneider did that, not apology, no apology video, I'm going to start calling it, the no apology video. When he did that video, he tried to put Brian Robbins under the bus and was like, oh, it was Robbins who, you know, hired Brian Peck. Not me, not me. Dan Schneider, yeah, right. You actually did hire Brian Peck on your own show that you created in 1998. So let's take a look at this clip. It's so terrifying. Trigger warning just because it's Brian Peck. Wait, I can't hear it. Oh, wait, can everyone hear this? And we can't put it up, can we? Oh, you're way up. Okay, okay. All right, here we go. Actually, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger because we should see this as big as we can. I mean, and it's with young kids, by the way, it's with young kids. Wait, I got to start it. I got to go back. I got to go back. I got to go back. I mean, John Wayne Gacy, I can't, maybe, I, no, I can't. It doesn't let me when I'm in the roadcaster. Um, but I mean, listen, he literally is a pen pal with John Wayne Gacy. And you're telling me that Dan Schneider, just by coincidence, made Brian Peck a freaking clown in his TV show that he created and also called him Happy Pants? Come on, Dan Schneider. No. Happy pants. And the fact that the clown is harassing these young, you know, children, essentially, I find that pretty interesting, too, because I'm guessing that earlier on in this episode, if I were to predict what the script was about, this episode was these kids end up, you know, having this clown do X, Y, and Z, but they don't have the money. Then they go home and the clown follows them home or finds out where they live and then is demanding money and harassing them. It's really weird that it's Brian Peck again playing this role. And again, he's saying his name is Happy Pants. And then the kids are literally saying Happy Pants. Kids continue. Ew, he is so scary. There's an angry clown in my corner. Why is he biting your kids? Fire 
I love that they just bail. I would 100% bail too if he showed up. But look at this. No. This is a nightmare. And if anyone missed that, he literally says in that, wow, there's like plain, I think P. Diddy's somewhere near um, like, uh, okay, so the what area you, because, what you why is it playing the video? I think P. Diddy's somewhere nearby because there's been helicopters, lizit, like, resit, like, like, I don't know, flying around the, the, the studio today. I don't know if anyone can hear it, but it's kind of bizarre after watching that raid. I never heard that many. Have you, Quiet? I've never heard. Really? Wow, I, I don't even remember that. Maybe once or twice. Okay, so when I heard Dan Schneider, you know, say that basically he had, you know, nothing to do basically with Brian Peck. He like almost said like that Peck guy. The way that he was referring to him was as if it was somebody he's met just here and there. My gut feeling when it comes to them is that they knew each other pretty well enough to hire him on his own show, enough to know possibly that he had a pen pal ship with John Wayne Gacy. Um, I don't know if he knew him well enough to call him happy pants, but I do find it pretty bizarre that Dan Schneider did hire him and he acts, and, and, and this is something else, I don't know, like I'm sorry, maybe I'm a little bit weird for saying this, but I do find it weird that Dan Schneider called Drake Bell just do something about it like my intuit you know when you watch something or you hear something and you just get that weird sixth sense that everyone else is like oh wow like shocked and then you're kind of the lone wolf with it and you're having a very different unsettling feeling with the information that's how I felt when I was listening to Drake say Dan called me and was like was it you how do you know that you know what I think oh I, I honestly, wow, I never actually thought about this. I would not be surprised if Brian Peck asked Dan Schneider to write a letter. Because what I've heard is Brian Peck's lawyer uh, ended up reaching out to a few people that declined and when they heard what the lawyer had to say about it, they were, the lawyer was pretty honest about, yeah, he did this and no, 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 but this, but this, but that. I would not be surprised because, like, I'm going to ask the chat this. Do you think, I'm trying to remember in the documentary, isn't it when, after, when Dan calls Drake to ask him if it was him, this was after he's come forward to the police, correct? This is after it's because Brian Peck, and listen, we saw the Leonardo DiCaprio footage with how Brian Peck was touching, you know, Leo uh, on set. I'm sorry, if any grown adult was witnessing that type of behavior on set on a kid's show, you better believe Dan Schneider saw that. <laughs> you know, like, I, I, it would be kind of shocking for him to say, no, I never witnessed that at all. I really doubt that, because I think Brian Peck was quite confident. Um, confident enough to hold a plate of pickles around children and literally eye side them. What is it? Side eye them? Side eye them, look downwards, and then side eye them again. You know, there was a confidence to Brian Peck, which, by the way, predators do have that type of confidence because they really do believe that they can manipulate everyone. They really do believe that they're going to get away with it. They really do believe this. They're, it's, it's a form of narcissism. They really think no one's ever going to stop them. And actually them being kind of upfront with their, what some people would call like, I don't know, when I, when I was younger, like wacky, you know, whatever. Them being upfront with that aspect makes people's defense go down because they're like, oh, this person's kidding. This person does it so often that it's part of their stick. You know, and so you doubt yourself, you doubt where the where the boundaries are and, and what's serious and, and, and honestly, what's not serious. You know what I mean? So it really it really messes with your mind. But I want one. OK, one in the chat that Brian Peck reached out to Dan Schneider to send a letter and two, if not. I'll make a poll. OK, quiet's going to make a poll. You can put me in the bottom while I go through this, actually, while you do that. Okay, so Brian Peck, 
asked Dan Dan to write a letter? Yes or no? Yeah. I I, I can't wait to hear this because I and, and I will get to these super chats in a moment. Okay. So guys like us as Happy Pants the Clown. Now moving on. French chef in the Amanda show. One. Look at all these ones. We got a lot of ones. We got a lot of ones. I'm telling you, I really think that that's correct. I can't believe that didn't, did anyone else think that? I can't believe that I literally just thought that, you know, right now. I had a feeling like, oh, Dan knew something, but I wasn't sure exactly how he knew. But now I know, or I think I know. All right, let, let's watch Brian Peck on The Amanda Show, shall we? <laughs> yep. You're not Amanda! That's exactly what it is. <laughs> no! Wait, no, Hi, no, Tina. no. I hate that TikTok mind. just like automatically gives you another video. That, wait, did everyone see what I just saw? Again, there's an innuendo there. You see Brian Peck literally with a French loaf that's extra long. <laughs> Can't even believe I'm saying that right now. But you get what I'm saying. And he's like tapping a guy and we get it, right? And again, this is the Amanda show. This is Brian Peck. It's like, wow, every single role. Now you have to understand how Brian Peck as a predator feels in that moment. Everything is catering to his, in my opinion, predatory behavior and how people are almost making a, what they want to say, a joke out of it. But for Brian Peck, it's a very serious thing. And sometimes predators can use humor as a way to get people's defense mechanisms to dissolve. And I've seen that a lot, actually. There are a few comedians that I've met in Hollywood that when you, you actually get to know them, they use humor as a way to belittle people and they use humor as a way to get away with a lot of behavior that wouldn't necessarily be okay if it wasn't a joke. And it goes back, honestly, to Devin Werkheiser, right? Like, or Dan Schneider, where everything's just humor to them. But everyone on the outside, if you really look at it, you know how it could impact or harm someone else, but they use that. And that's another um, tool of a predator, to be honest with you, is is using things again. Get, get, get your votes in. We're going to end the poll. We're at 95%. Oh, my God. We're yes. at 95%. I just saw it. Sorry. I didn't even see. It's not on my phone, which is so odd. That, okay. We're at 95%. Yes. Think, it has to be. If you're on mobile, you got to refresh. And it'll and then poll will pop up. I see. Oh, true, true, true. But yeah, keep going. Okay, so ninety five percent. Okay, so Dan Schneider, we got guys like us. Dan, I'm surprised that you didn't mention that in your no apology video that you created with Boogie. Okay, so now moving on. Ah, <sighs> so Brian Peck indeed wrote and directed the Willies. Can you believe this? He wrote and directed The Willies, and it was with children. And listen, I'm telling you right now, this monster is Brian Peck's true version of himself. I'm telling you. I really see how he's, like, getting into the tent of the children. There's something about it that makes my skin just... I, goosebumps like it's just really scary and it's called the willies i don't even need to say anymore honestly Good evening, when <laughs> and welcome to the car <laughs> mm -mm. same vibe though same vibe i mean look at th this is kind of wild so making his first and only feature film endeavor which released in 1990 a harmless backyard camp out becomes an unforgettable night of chills and thrills for three young boys as they share their favorite scary stories. Let's take a look a little bit at this trailer. I'm a little bit afraid. Oh! And they're happening to Danny Hollister. Oh my God. I don't even feel comfortable putting that there. What the? I forgot that from the other live. 
I mean, I mean, and guess, oh, I gotta get out of here. And guess who else is in this film? I remember when we were watching the trailer, there was an individual who actually wrote one of the worst, honestly, letters in defense of Brian Peck. Where is she? What's her name? She's like a blonde woman. She was in Twin Peaks. Anyways, I'm not going to go digging for her. But this whole film is literally revolved around children and this guy trying to get each child alone with the monster. Like, the monster keeps trying to get each child alone with him. And it's so bizarre what, when you now know who Brian Peck is and you really look into the film, it's almost like Brian Peck was writing a film about himself, like a horror flick about himself. And it's beyond, beyond terrifying. It's just, that was a fucking crow. It's because we were talking about Brian Peck. <laughs> the crow knew. Yeah, Kimmy, wait, who is it? Kimmy Robertson? Kimmy Robertson. Yeah, Kimmy Robertson. She's in the willies. Such a horror. And she apparently still hangs out with him. Like 2021, has her arm on his shoulder. Like, horrible. Okay, so there's a few people that were executive producers of the Willies, and we're going to get into them because you're going to be pretty shocked about these people. So, oh, Brad Southwick. Brad, are you out there? I wonder where Brad is right now. I wonder if he's watching because he's on the thumbnail. <laughs> Brad, what you, who you have worked with, not only Brian Peck, but Victor Selva, you make me want to throw up everywhere, honestly. Brad Southwick is a film producer and line producer known for working on the Willies Children of the Corn 3 and Jeepers Creepers 3. Brian Peck was created as Jake in Children of the Corn 3 and in 1995 and Brad worked with convicted PDF file Victor Selva on Jeepers Creepers. Let's go full screen for a second because I want to remind everybody who Victor Selva is. All right, we can share my screen. So Victor Selva, in 1988, Selva was convicted of S misconduct with one of clown houses. Oh, shit. Wait, I didn't even read that until now. Wait, what, what, what's with the clown shit? Wait, with, wait, John Wayne Gacy was obsessed with being a clown. Then you got Brian Peck, a clown. M Mr. Happy Pants or whatever. Now you got Victor Selva, Clown House, which I'm assuming is one of his films. Can we have the chat? I want to see the chat here. What? Wait, 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 wait. What do you think this all... Why? What is a clown to these people? Is it because a clown is a male... Like, he has access to children, like uh, birthday parties, you know, uh, children events? I think that definitely plays a role in it right and yeah. something creepy about yeah, it there's right cre there's like some kind of like creepiness about it it's like eerie I don't, yeah i i like get it but I, I don't at the same time i get it and i don't at the same time too yeah. wait i see melanie i love you yeah creepy she's yeah. gonna be she's gonna be with i us. know okay. she's gonna be with us with bj okay so which i can't wait to talk about i'm gonna be on bj later with melanie we'll get into that a little bit later we're timing right now I don't even want to associate them with each other. The Clown House's underage stars, who was only 12 years old. 12 years old at the time and videotaping one of the encounters in which he forced up. To perform OS on him. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. And look at what's underneath here. Does Victor Selva work for Disney? Wow, great question to ask. <laughs> One particularly bizarre incident took place in the 1990s when Disney hired Victor Selva to direct a new project called Powder, initially gaining a local reputation for being a cinephile and a PDF file. Selva earned Francis Ford Coppola's admiration, who funded his 1989 feature, Clown House. Holy shit. Francis Ford Coppola was a part of funding 
this PDF file's first film, Clown House. Do you? Th- what's with this PDF file um, den? You know, I, I know people like to call it a ring, but I, I honestly think it's a den. I'm, I've, I've been calling it the den, the den of iniquity, thanks to Ryan, or what, writer from Boy Meets World. But it's really interesting to me that they're all connected. Right, it only took what two connections here. So you got Brian Peck, you got the Willies. You see who's producing that film. You follow who's producing that film. It leads you to him producing another PDF Files film. And again, this clown connection. It's pretty eerie. I bet it's a lot scarier than uh, than Brian Peck's uh, shitty horror film. But it's like legit scary. Like legit, really, really, really scary. He I mean literally contains CP. It was also found in his home. Not only did he did, do what he did, and then Disney hires him. It's just so gross. So let's not forget this guy's name, Brad Southwick. What's up with you, Brad? What's your uh, open secret? Just curious. Why are, you, why are you producing multiple films with multiple PDF files? I find that to be a little bit um, of of a red flag, if you know what I mean. Okay, so we got Brad. Let's not forget these people. No problem. We got Gary Depp (laughs) Ew. That's what we're going to call him. Gary Depp Ew. Gary Depp Ew. Depp (laughs) Ew. God. Grew up in San Diego making backyard movies with an 8 millimeter camera alongside his still best friend. So uh, apparently on IMDb, by the way, let me see if it's here. Let's see if I can if I can find this really quickly. I think it's from his IMDb. It's so odd. I think in his bio, he has it that it says he's still friends with Brian Peck. I don't know where it is, but it's like somewhere in here. I don't see it, but I remember seeing it yesterday where he literally says he's still friends with Brian Peck. And you're like, wow, still? Uh, Gary is known for producing such films as Children of the Corn 3. And weird enough, you guys, I was in the movie Children of the Corn. And that's actually when I started to talk to my predator, Michael Milos. So it was kind of like triggering for me because you're like, okay. And this is interesting. So Gary Debu, Depew, Depew. Wait, Gary did you work Depew. on the one that you were in? Or no, I, thank okay. God. No, no, no. Way later. But still the same film. But what's interesting, so we got Gary Depew working on um, Children of the Corn 3. And we also have Brad Southwick working on Children of the Corn 3. And again, working with multiple PDF files. There's something weird about these guys. Can't say right? But there's something very peculiar that these men all work together. So Angel 4, Undercover, these films look so bad, you guys. <laughs> and Jack and the Beanstalk. Brian Peck was casted as Jake in Children of the Corn 3 in 1995, the guitar salesman in Angel 4, and in 2009, after his conviction, the Emperor in Jack and the Beanstalk. So this film <clears throat> I almost cussed at him. Gary Depew hired Brian Peck after his conviction. Let's let's take a look at what film. What film did you hire Brian Peck for? Gary, did he have children in it? Was he a clown? Or did he have access to children? These people make me sick to my stuff. Hollywood makes me sick. I want you to sell the cow, Jack. What can I do for you? How can I help? Oh my God, that guy! What he needs? It's everything I have. It's a young I'm boy. The cow. <laughs> this fool! What the hell is going on here? Sorry. Wait. Right away, it's a young boy. This guy, and you better believe, I'm gonna ask someone if he wrote a letter. I want to know if this guy wrote a letter. I bet he fucking did. I don't know why I have a feeling that this guy wrote a letter, but I feel like he did. Because remember, there was 41 letters, and not all letters have been released yet. I have a feeling that this Depew, I can't stand his last name, Depew, wrote a letter for Brian Peck, and the fact that he would literally give him a film after he's a convicted PDF file, and it has a young boy in it. And also it makes me kind of, who are you, Depew? Oh, wait, this is Depew? 
yeah, dude, this is... No, 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 not this guy. This is the guy who directed it, hired Brian Peck, and worked with him two times before his conviction oh, as okay, well. Okay, okay. So he has a long... He's been friends with him for a long time, essentially. But to give him access to another boy, shame on you, bro. And who are you, dude? What's your connection to the clowns? Are you a clown too? That's how I'm gonna get. That's how. I'm, that's my new question. Are you a clown too? You know what I mean. Are you a clown too? Because why would you do this? A normal, a, a ran, I, I don't know. A person with a heart would not do this. They just wouldn't. Three beans? You're gonna give me three lousy beans for my cow. If you think you know the story of a boy and his beanstalk... Whoa! You don't know. That's kind of weird, too. Also, I saw someone say, like, maybe Brian Robbins got asked from Brian Peck to write a letter, and then Brian Robbins told Dan. But regardless, like, and that's kind of a good point, too. That could have happened as well. But when you think about this a little bit, it makes you think about how all of these people are connected with one another and how, why? And why these inside jokes that are open secrets or these open secrets that are inside jokes? Have you noticed that? It's like these open secrets that are inside jokes that you see in a lot of this material, this content that was created by these clowns, right? It's, it's, it's pretty peachy streams, power to survivors, power to survivors. I mean, to give him access to a child just, I mean, it's kind of out of this world, really. Okay, it gets, it gets by the way, it gets weirder. It definitely gets weirder. Okay, so we got Gary DePew. Now we have Rich Carell. So Gary DePew grew up in San Diego. Oh, wait, why is it showing me the same thing? Wait, I love that Rich is also Gary Miko. You <laughs> to be honest, they are all DePews. They're all clowns and they're all DePews, to be quite honest with me. I don't really necessarily see a difference between them. We all know who Rich Carell is, right? Brian Peck was casted as the mirror in The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody from 2006 to uh, 2007 after his conviction. And for those of you that don't know, let's just take a look really quickly because it's always good to, you know, take a look at what his role was. Is it here? Joy to London, my presents are coming. Let me receive good things. <laughs> London. Get up. Santa! <laughs> no, it's me, your mirror, not Santa. Oh, you slay me. <laughs> it's a little Christmas humor. <laughs> if this voice woke me up in the middle of the night, I swear to God, I think I would actually throw that mirror, like, out the window. I, if this voice, even if I didn't know who Brian Peck was or is, I would, that voice is honestly the worst, in my personal opinion. It's just so creepy. His actual voice is so creepy. It's, and he's a mirror looking at children. That's also so weird too. Rich, you also hire him as a mirror, a mirror that children look into. It is so weird, these I don't clowns. <laughs> well, anyway, what are you doing here, mirror? It's time for you to reflect on the error of your ways. Are you saying you don't like the extensions? Well, truthfully, you're not fooling anyone. <gasps> anyway, I'm here to take you on a little trip. Come on. No. Step into me. Oh, no. Step into me. Step into me. Why is everything an innuendo with Brian Peck? And, you know, it's so irresponsible, too, because I remember just seeing a lot of, like, random even guest stars on Zoe 101 or Nickelodeon, right? And at, when we got older, they would reach out to them, like just random coast, like co-stars even. Um, kids will find them, you know, because they try to look at everybody who is in an episode they like. Why it's so irresponsible of Disney, of Rich Carell, in my opinion, is legit the fact that kids are going to maybe like that episode go and look who it is, maybe find this person's Instagram account, you know, and start reaching out. And after yesterday's episode, when we looked at all of Dan Schneider's subliminal messaging on his T-shirts to go follow him on Twitter, to bring traffic, right, to his social media, and we're talking about children, 
heading on over to his social media account, his private social media account. It's so dangerous when you're dealing with people like Brian Peck. Why even give him any access at all to children unless you're a clown, right? Unless you're a clown, which uh, these guys are giving me some clown vibes, you know, as of now. So, okay, so Brian Peck was the mirror. So gross. And now we got Brian Singer. And so I'm going to wait for the chat to say some things about Brian Singer. Because I'm pretty sure Brian Singer was also mentioned in Open Secret that we're going to be watching tomorrow. Finally made it live. Love you from Zoe 101. Always my favorite. Sorry what happened to you. Many others and ones continuing to come forward. Myself and comics, thank you so much. It's Jordan. Not trying to generalize, but some men are just... Agreed. Agreed. Guys like us. I mean, guys like them, you mean? Guys like them. Dan Schneider worked for Keenan's 2021 show on NBC. I did not know that, Brendan. Great find. I did not know that. Um, elevators. Hi, Alexa. I was wondering if you got my email. I took a deeper look into the Amanda Please website and I found some truly disturbing stuff. I will look into that tonight. Thank you so much for flagging that for me. Okay, so we got Brian Singer. So we know Brian Singer, right? And the allegations against him. I mean, honestly, they're so beyond disturbing. You know, allegedly, what I've heard in Hollywood from so many different people is that Brian Singer has these parties. Let me tell you how often these parties happen, by the way, in Hollywood. These parties, these parties that a lot of men have in Hollywood are an open secret. Speaking of open secrets. And a lot of these individuals think they're just going to a party or they think they're going to a party where, you know, that person's connected to their job in some way. And, you know, you find out it's a trap. And that that whole party is, you know, part of the predator's prey. And so this is very common in the industry, these parties. And obviously we're learning about them through P. Diddy. We're learning from, you know, many different people who have come forward in Hollywood about these Hollywood parties. And so many people. Uh, yeah, it's triggering. So I'm not going to go into it. But you, but you know what I mean. So when I, when I would hear about Brian Singer... I would hear a lot about his parties, you know, just from word of mouth. And, you know, it seems like Brian Singer and Brian Peck are very close. So let's take a look here. Brian Singer is an American film director and producer who got his start by directing The Usual Suspects. He was hired by 20th Century <clears throat> Fox to direct X-Men, which kickstarted the superhero renaissance. Singer is alleged to have D-R-U-G-G-E-D and art actor and model Michael Egan, the third in Hawaii, after initially meeting him at parties hosted by convicted S.O. Mark Collins Rector in the late 1990s. I mean, look at this den, this den of iniquity, these clowns. These clowns. Brian Peck was casted as a hot dog. Here we go again with Brian Peck. See, they all knew, I swear to God. I swear to God they all knew. I swear to God. As a hot dog stand patron in X-Men. A hot dog stand patron in X-Men. In 2000 and a news reporter in X2. And in 2003, around the time of Brian's conviction. Great. So it's the two Bryans. We got three Bryans, right? We got Brian Robbins. We got Brian Singer. Wait, who is the other one? Brian Robbins, Brian Singer, Brian Peck. You know, they're they're the three clowns, I guess. They are the three freaking clowns. I'm I, I honestly not gonna look at that name again. Sorry if someone is Brian in here, but that this is not this is not a good look for the Bryans right now. So Tom DeSanto, and obviously we know that Tom DeSanto was somebody who wrote a letter. So Tom DeSanto is an American film producer and screenwriter known for his work on the X-Men films. He wrote a letter of support on behalf of convicted S.A. criminal Brian Peck, featured in the documentary Quiet on Set. Brian Peck was casted as a hot dog stand patron in X-Men. I love this is like, um, so he, I guess, produced that film that Brian Peck was in. 
Tom DeSanto did make a public apology uh, towards Drake, but from my knowledge, still hasn't made a personal apology. And for me right now, I'm going to tell you guys just quite honestly, after growing up in Hollywood for the most part and learning how all of these individuals know one another, I don't trust anyone connected with these people because it's not like every single person you can go and see them all connected. You know what I mean? I bet if we looked into Ryan Gosling, I'm just picking up a random like celebrity, right? We look at Ryan Gosling. I really doubt he has any of these type of connections per se. And so when I see too many connecting dots, my mom says this, and I really like this saying where she says, you know, too many coincidences equals a plan. And it's just true. Like for me, like how I've seen it play out in my life when I'm like, wait, that was weird. And that kind of was strange. And usually when too many coincidences are happening around somebody, start taking notice of that because that's most likely a red flag, you know, because that's not something that happens often. It's not something that happens often. And remember Tom DeSanto did write a letter in defense of Brian Peck and did know enough and still wrote that letter. He knew enough that it was a child. He knew enough that it was Brian Peck and that should have been enough, right? So Tom DeSanto just honestly freaks me out. Peachy, power to survivors, power to survivors. Power to survivors. Survivor. Power to survivors. Okay, now I like showing these faces to these, uh, these names, right? Now let's get into Ryan Little. Now this guy is a, a clown, another clown, right? Got a lot of clowns here. Ryan Little the Clown. See, it actually works kind of perfect, right? Ryan Little the Clown, born 28 March 1971, is a Canadian film director, cinematographer, and producer. He is perhaps best known for his employment of Brian Peck in his films Love Surreal, Outlaw Trail, The Treasure of Butch Cassidy, and Forever Strong, starring Sean Astin, who was also in The Willies. Nobody knows these movies. No one knows these movies, but all of these movies feature Brian Peck, and this person like literally hires him multiple times. Brian Peck was casted as corporate officer number two in Love Surreal in 2006. He was Clay in Outlaw Trail in 2006. This is after the conviction. And an associate producer for... Forever Strong in 2008, all of which were after his conviction. So this is one of, honestly, the first ones that has hired him multiple times after his conviction. So, you know, this guy is still in Hollywood making shitty movies, obviously. It kind of look, they all kind of look like, um, I, I don't know what type of films, like films that you see randomly on like, I don't know, TNT. <laughs> Does it not? Yeah, is it like... Is that what it is? That's what I was saying. Like, nobody knows those movies. No, it was, like, they're best just known random. for literally nothing. Well, he just did something recently, but the films that Brian Peck was in, like, no one knows these films. But he is actually working in Hollywood. I think he just worked, like, a few months ago on some HBO project. I think that was, I think Ryan Little was the one that I saw doing that. So these people are working, you know? So it's good to know who these people are because for me personally, Clown vibes now. Just be on the lookout for if you're in Hollywood, you happen to become part of a film or a TV show and Ryan Little, I don't know, be on the lookout for that. And also make sure that Brian Peck wasn't rehired by him. Now, this is where it gets super strange. And I almost, I just honestly could not believe it when I found this out. You guys. Jonah Hill. I don't know if anyone knows uh, about me coming forward about Jonah Hill and what he did to me when I was 15. So, yeah. Jonah Hill hired, essentially, I mean, he was an executive producer on a movie called Freaks of Nature. And they hired him as the role of zombie dad. Here's a real alleged dad that we got going on hired, here. Hired Brian Peck. Hired Brian Peck. Okay. Yeah. Jonah Hill hired Brian Peck, which is so weird to me because, you know, I don't know if he was just putting himself, you know, on the project. Sometimes people with big names will start to attach themselves to films and put their names on it and aren't necessarily a part of each process. 
of of auditioning, you know, et cetera. But this is pretty weird. When I saw Jonah Hill and Brian Peck somehow on the same IMDb page, you know, that is just bizarre. Alleged dad, Kelsey. So I guess also uh, Vanessa Hudgens was also in this film. There's also Charlie Sheen, and I guess Brian Peck got hired as Charlie Sheen's dialogue coach or something like that on anger management. And we all know the controversies around Charlie Sheen and his by winning and his uh, Tiger B L O O D and you know the whole thing. And then Corey Feldman had a, a, a allegations against him when it came to Corey Heim. But then Corey Heim's mother ended up saying that Charlie Sheen was not the person who was the predator when it came to her son. And so there, this that's a whole other. I don't know if people have been looking into that, but. Does anyone know that Corey Heim's mom legit said that, you know, Corey Feldman was not telling the truth about who hurt her son? There's an article about it, and it was kind of, you know, how I feel about Corey Feldman. There's obviously a lot of accusations against him and police reports and this and that and tweets at a 15 and 16-year-olds. And, you know, I have a video about that. But to hear... Corey Heim's mother say that Corey Feldman's, you know, that Corey Feldman is lying. And she ends up saying who the person, who the clown was, who the clown was when it came to Corey Heim. And it wasn't uh, uh, Charlie Sheen. It was this other individual. And you're like, that's a little bit shady. You know, that's a little bit weird. Why would... So who is telling the truth there? What, what's exactly happening? But there's some footage of, like, Charlie Sheen, you know, flying in a private jet with Brian Peck. And, you know, it's, it, it's definitely a bit concerning. And Charlie Sheen is, does not have the best track record. And I just wouldn't be, honestly, um, you know, too surprised when it comes to Hollywood. So there's also this other producer here. His name is Sean Astin, starring Forever Strong. Peck's role, he was associate producer. And the reason why I'm making this today, here's another one. Um, executive producer, the Willies, writer, director, is because, yeah, when we look at these guys, right, these are some guys who are making some shitty films, right? Nonetheless, though, some of them, and actually a lot of them what we mentioned today, were giving access to, ch like, giving Brian Peck access to children, even after his conviction, and yeah, we can sit here and go, oh, some of these films I don't know. But Nickelodeon, we do. And even though it was before his conviction, Disney was after his conviction. And Rich Carell not only worked for Disney, but he also worked for Nickelodeon. And I forgot to note this, that Guys Like Us, where, where Brian Peck plays a clown, Rich Carell was a part of that show as well. And, you know, for me, when you're just seeing all these different names and these people are all interconnected and it's clown this and it's clown that and it's this innuendo and this hot dog and this long french loaf and this pickle and this look down and this i shouldn't even have had to say that many things right because that's enough it's a little bit bizarre and it's almost like in plain sight and sometimes when it comes to predatory behavior you know, they, they really do things in plain sight because they want to see who's going to, like, if they're showing true versions, like the true version of themselves, they're actually, it's a game. They're curious. They're preying on your uh, conviction. And, well, no, and also, are you going to believe your own feeling? They, they look for that. They want to know, like, are you going to trust yourself when you feel what I just showed you or not? And the more that they learn you don't, the more they can take, honestly, advantage of you, to be quite honest with you. And they're constantly testing that to see where their boundaries are with each person. And usually when they see one person really stay true to, like, what they're feeling about them, they'll start to try to isolate that person away from the majority of the people that they need. And that happens a lot, too. Because, like, you know the saying, divide and conquer? Straight up predator. That is, that is what a predator is. Anytime you think of that term, divide and conquer, that's what predators do. That's where it comes from. It's honestly the peak 
predatory behavior is divide and conquer. And so usually when they see somebody who is not agreeing, like look, for example, Brian Peck, right? When it came to Drake Bell's dad, who was taking notice and saw it and believed what he felt and went to Brian Robbins and went to Karen, whatever her name is, and 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 be- believed himself and was protective of his son, what did Brian Peck do? Divide and conquer. And that's what they do. And they're constantly testing to see which person is going to look the other way and which person is going to, you know, do something about it, which is why we really need people to trust their their feelings when it comes to predatory behavior because they are also preying on you doubting yourself. That's what I'm looking for. They're preying on you doubting yourself. They want to see if you're a person that doubts yourself or not. It's a game for them. And so it's part of the hunt, essentially. But so what I'm saying is, yeah, we see people in small films, like these small indie films, and then we got Nickelodeon, and then we got Disney, and this all kind of ripples out. And the reason why I wanted to do, you know, this episode today before, you know, next week I'm going to do an open letter to Brian Robbins, but I really want to take a few more days to write my open letter to Brian Robbins because I want to make sure I say pretty much everything I need to say. But the reason why I wanted to do this episode is because we're going to watch Open Secret tomorrow for members and a lot of these people were actually mentioned in open secret but also a lot more and so it's kind of like a precursor for tomorrow and just because we look at this as the past from my knowledge what I've been learning is these things are still happening now they're still happening now and it's so easy for us all right to go like clown enabler clown enabler the whole thing and and be like I wouldn't do that but to be honest with you I really do believe that every single person has been put in a situation where maybe they didn't necessarily believe what they were feeling in that moment and someone was able to do something maybe to somebody that wasn't necessarily right I'm not even saying this is SA or CSA I just mean I've personally even had moments where in my life where I'm like, that person gave me a really weird vibe. And I maybe didn't tell my friend. And then later she told me that he was like abusive, right? And so, yes, we can sit here all day and look at all of these people that enabled Brian Peck. But I think it's also very important for all of us as a community to really make sure that we are on the lookout for predatory behavior at all times, when it comes to friend groups, when it comes to work environments, because I do believe we have spidey senses and we do feel something, but we kind of doubt ourselves. And not saying that right away you, you just go with the first thing that comes to mind about how you're feeling, but that gives you the awareness to go, I'm not sure about this person and I'm just gonna be a little bit more extra. Yeah, it's like your intuition. And so we're all, we're all part of this. And so it's really important for us to not only sit here and look at each enabler and, and, and throw up on them, to be quite honest with you, but it's also important for us to make sure that we're showing up in community. And what we're doing right now, by the way, me sitting here, you sitting on the other side of the screen, and us participating in this dialogue is part of that. It's part of us starting to have these tough conversations where how can we show up as a community better? Because this is an issue that affects so many. And um, the more allies, right, the better. Because they are preying on us not doing anything about it and not having the conversation, right? Welcome new members, welcome new members. Got into your chat, Nick Doc. Um, thank you, Courage. Oh, thank you, Meg. Thank you, Meg S. and Ruby. Every person who signed a letter for Brian is just as guilty as him to me. To a no contest conviction, disappointed James Marsden was on the list. Yeah. And you know, there are so many people I've met in Hollywood and honestly, just in real life. And I mean, like in, in friends groups that aren't in Hollywood that I've been disappointed by. And that's just the reality of these things. You know, that's why we don't want to idolize anyone ever. We want to make sure that we're always just seeing people eye to eye because that's another thing. Predators can also prey on the fact that their power position and and then that influence, the influence it has on us. And so we put them into on a pedestal and that can make us 
overlook things. And so that's actually a very good point, what you just said there. Peachy streams power to survivors. It's Jordan not trying to generalize. Some men are just, I feel that. And that Keenan 2021 show on NBC is wild to me. So Keenan hired Dan Schneider in 2021, even after he was booted, in my opinion, from Nickelodeon. Elevators, highlights. I wonder if you got an email. I took it. Okay, that I'm going to check on tonight. Thank you so much for reminding me about your email. So tomorrow, God, all those men are just those those clowns. I'm sorry. I can. I'm honestly just going to see them as clowns from this point on. I just that's it. The clown house thing. The fact that the John Wayne Gacy thing. The fact that Brian Peck played Happy Pants the clown. There's just something very bizarre uh, about it. I'm going to honestly look a little bit more into how i mean i guess that's it's like priest or something like that where you dress up like that and you get to go to kids parties or something you get access to children i get it but it's still just gross it's just i never liked clowns i yeah. never yeah i never liked clowns i i saw it when i was younger and it that was actually one of the scariest films i've ever seen I have my mo. I feel the, like that's a part of it. I feel like they know that kids get like scared <gasps> because of that movie, and like a, it, I feel like something about the fear that clowns. You're put in right. The kids, it's like yeah, it's something super. Stop. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I, I was trying to say that earlier. I didn't. I couldn't figure out the, the exact feeling, but yeah, it's that. That just freaked me out because you're right. Because in the movie, it isn't it true that he feeds off of their fear. I'm pretty sure in it, yeah, he feeds off of their fear. That's yeah, what penny, it is. Pennywise. Pennywise. Oh, I'm sorry. That just, that was awful. You're totally right. That's what it is. It's the fear. And then it's like, you know how kids, then parents are like, don't be afraid. It's just a clown. That's that's like predator shit. Like it's that that push pull where you're like, I'm scared of this, but it's supposed to be for kids, right, you know. Right, and it, yeah. then you doubt yourself. It's that whole wow. That just really tripped me out. I never liked clowns either. Yeah, Stephen King. What's up with Stephen King? You know what's so interesting about Stephen King? Like I remember reading an interview when I was pregnant with my second um, child. I read this whole interview of Stephen King t t talking about how like his mom had all home births. And it's so funny because, like, all of these, like, hippies, you know, they'll be like, you have a home birth and your kid is, you know, going to be like this. And then, you know, you read Stephen King's books and you're like, you're a home birth kid? <laughs> like, what? I remember reading that be like, that's hilarious. That's how you know all that shit's kind of like, you know, it's just your own decision, obviously. But Stephen King, I guess, was a home birth. And I'm like, wow, interesting. What a weird... The Shining is honestly one of the scariest books I've ever read. Oh, speaking of books... I just started listening to Jeanette McCurdy's book. I never read Jeanette McCurdy's book. I've only had, you know, read pieces of it on samples or through interviews. And I've never just sat down. And when I realized that I could hear her tell it, like through an audiobook, I downloaded it last night. And wow, I'm just really, I was pretty blown away last night on just listening to her. It's just so honest. And it, it, it's almost like, like a, it's a revolt when child stars are honest and almost unapologetically because in the industry, we are constantly taught to play pretend and we are constantly taught to please those around us and to be professional. And there's all of these layers that get added onto ourselves from the industry. So when you hear any child star, like when I look at Amanda Bynes, I was pretty upset about the other day. Megyn Kelly said something because, you know, obviously Megyn Kelly and I do not have the same um, politics, right, whatsoever. And when Megyn Kelly was interviewing me, she goes, uh, I was looking at Amanda Bynes and she doesn't even look like herself. And, and when I look at Amanda Bynes or, you know, when I look at Amanda Bynes specifically, I see freedom. I, I just see a person being them. Like, it's just so weird to me that people still want to put people in boxes and want people to be what they want them to be and not seeing what a person wants to be and, and loving that and, and, like, seeing that that's beautiful. It's just so bizarre to me when she said that, like, she doesn't even look like herself. Like, 
what's what is it to you by the way you know what i mean well, like yeah, she, i mean she's basing that off off what you know this this idea patriarchy of, well yeah like like of, of her of the image that she was on nickelodeon mm -hmm. that was like super manufactured by these people that are right. not good right but you can tell like i think megan kelly would lean more towards the the version of amanda maybe before yeah, that's then, what I'm saying. Yeah. That, yeah. Is that she, you know, yeah, like, she's well, basing it off of that and not just who her she as is. a regular person. Right. Right. Like, she wouldn't right. say that about some regular person. You're right. But because she has this idea of who Amanda Bynes was once. Right. And it wasn't Amanda Bynes, that's necessarily. Not her. That was a manufactured idea of you right. know, this person. Right. And it's so true. I feel like women, even specifically, are just you that we're like told that we have to appear a certain way for people and it is the objectifying thing like it is feeling like you're an object at all times and so when i see you know shanae o'connor or like you know britney spears and and you know jeanette mccurdy listening to her um tell her story when, when we hear people t showing the world who they are truly and unapologetically there is some, I think it's like one of the most beautiful things ever in this world is when you see someone just be honest and truthful. It's like, it because it, this world's so, we're told constantly to pretend and honestly money's fake. So many things are fake and, and man-made in the world that when you get to witness something that's true, like it's just to me, one. it's my, that's why I named my son Truth. It's, I, that's, I have an allegiance to the truth. I really... It's the most beautiful thing in this world. It's like a sunset or a sunrise to me. And so listening to her last night, I was like, wow, it's just so beautiful that she was able to be that honest about her mom and just the whole thing. Anyways, I'll, I'll do maybe like a little book review once I'm, I'm finished with it. But it was just such an incredible, I want to see more of that. And I hope, you know, it inspired me. And I hope, I hope that Jeanette's even able to inspire so many people out there to, you know, Fuck the molds of what we're told to be by these clowns, by, you know, these people out there, predatory behavior. You know, being ourselves is honestly the best thing that we can do. And I do think it's also part of changing the world is when we get really honest with ourselves, and that we actually trust our honesty and know that that is every single person has their own type of self and when you tap into that, it's, I, I don't know, it's just like, I think the whole world opens up when you do that. Something very beautiful about it. But that was like my thoughts while I was listening to Jeanette McCurdy. I know it's like kind of like, whoa, okay, Alexa. But it was one of my thoughts last night listening to it. I was like, I love honesty. I just love, and especially, you know, hearing a woman, you're just like, yes, be honest. Like, just be, be yourself and, and fuck all this bullshit, basically. Like, who cares about this bullshit? I honestly think that's also part of predatory behavior, but that's a, uh, another discussion for another day. It's Britney, bitch. <laughs> yes, it's Britney, bitch. Oh my God, that was perfect timing. Well, thank you tell, all. Tell people where you're going to be going. Oh, oh, we're going to BJ. That's right. So I will be leaving this stream and hopping onto the Surprise Witness BJ's stream and just, is it what, 5 or 5.30? Um, she's asking, do you want to go at 4.45? 4.45. Okay, so 4.45. Hop, hopping over there to have a conversation with her and Melanie. I'm really looking forward to that. Melanie is one of my best friends. And honestly, Surprise Witness is an inspiration in general with what she was able to uncover when it came to Britney Spears and TriStar. And so we're going to have a conversation. And so please follow, subscribe, and head over to her channel and um, watch us have a conversation. It's like, kind of so weird. I'm like, I'm leaving this room and I'm going into another room. But I'll see you on the other side. And tomorrow, so 4.30 Pacific Standard Time is movie night. We're watching Open Secret. Um, grab a drink, grab some food, um, and we're going we're gonna to really uh, dive into it. Thank you, every new member that is here. And thank you, every super chat. And if I missed you, I'm so sorry. Um, just thank you all for, for being here and supporting and, um, s make sure that you're on the lookout for, uh, the clowns out there. Stay safe. Bye everyone. Mm -hmm.